For more information, you can visit my website at www.aelewisministries.org. But right now we're studying the sins of the tongue, mainly gossip, and we are studying what a vicious sin gossip is. Now, first of all, you as a believer, well, you may not be a believer, and that's fine. By the end of the message, you'll get a chance to make a decision. So you can uh, at least listen through about 15 minutes and then make your decision as to whether or not you wish to become a believer. I understand your reservations because many believers are gossips. And they've probably gossiped about you and what you do. And you may have been to a few churches where they gossiped about you and your lifestyle and you didn't like it because it really didn't make much sense to you. It doesn't make much sense to me either. So let's uh, delve into what the Word of God really has to say and stop relying on what mankind has to say and how man likes to judge and how so many preachers become preachers simply because they're very good at being self-righteous. It's a real sad state of affairs that we find ourselves in within this country and around the world as Christians. We're failing. So it's your responsibility as a believer. Do you know when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you become a royal priest that's found in 1st Peter chapter 3 or actually 2nd Peter a royal priest actually 1st Peter 3 9 a royal priest part of a royal priesthood what does that mean it means you represent yourself before God now the Catholics are messed up because they think that there are human priests still now there were in the Old Testament but not anymore and so what do they do? They go to their human priest and tell their human priest what sins they've committed, and then they give them some type of penance. But that's not what the Bible says at all, and, it's not, uh, and it has nothing to do with Bible doctrine. Because you as a priest have a responsibility to yourself to self-evaluate to judge your own life. And you have to judge your own life in the light of the standards of God's Word. How are you going to do so? Well, obviously, you've got to know God's Word. So it's very important that in your priorities, I know starting out during your lag time, you may listen here and there, but as you grow in grace and in knowledge, you'll want to know more and more about this wonderful life, this life of magnificent freedom, this life of magnificent virtue. There's nothing like it. There's nothing else in the world that will make you happy. I've seen people who have been exposed to these teachings of the Word of God and have gone astray, and they are the most miserable creatures I've ever met. Psychotic, even. Now it's your responsibility to evaluate yourself. You look in your mirror. You don't need anyone to lean on. I remember uh, going to Tennessee once to uh, meet uh, a family who was associated with Moses on Wabiko. And Moses on Wabiko is a great evangelist who goes all around, not a missionary and an evangelist, who goes all around the world giving the gospel. And one of the young ladies there was conflicted. She had a dilemma or a conundrum Actually, she had a conundrum because she had several people, more than three, more than four, always wanting to get involved and you tell me your sins, I'll tell you my sins, we'll help each other out. When you feel as if you're going to commit a sin, tell me about it and I'll, 
I'll talk you out of it, and when I feel like I want to sin, you talk me out of it. Now, none of this is in Scripture. You are a priest. You represent yourself before God. You don't represent yourself before another human being. So the word of God in the soul produces the standards of grace. And it's a grace righteousness. Grace isn't a license to sin. Grace is your license to live the spiritual life. And there is such a thing as a grace righteousness. It's called dikaiosune in the Greek. But then on the other hand, there's a self-righteousness. And that's called, in the Greek, well, it's not time for me to give you what it's called in the Greek just yet. But there is a self-righteousness that is totally, mutually exclusive to grace righteousness. They're antithetical, opposites. Now, two verses are very pertinent to the fact that there are self-righteous people filled with arrogance. There are believers that we call, in terms of a language, legalistic. So let's look at Romans 14.4. You might as well turn there. It is in Scripture. And you might as well realize that what I teach comes directly from Scripture. Oh, I talk a lot. And I do explain a lot of what Scripture is saying, but all of it is related to Scripture. And in Romans 14, 4, you'll see that. And by the way, the self-righteousness is called by Paul, in the Greek, skubala. S-K-U-B-A-L-A. -A. And if you are one who is inquisitive and you want to find out what that means, try it. I know exactly what it means. It's not flattering whatsoever. And there are believers who are full of scubala. The Apostle Paul used the word. Now Romans 14.4 You who are you to judge the servant of another? Well, right there we can stop and have some principles. You, who are you to, jerk, to judge the servant of another? Now, you as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are either a good servant of the Lord or a bad servant of the Lord, but either way, you're a servant of the Lord. So when you judge, gossip, malign, wag that tongue against a fellow believer, what are you doing? You're judging the servant of another. What gives you that right? Nothing does. It's just arrogance, the old sin nature. So in its entirety, you, who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own Lord he stands or falls, and stand he will, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Do you know what that means? Grace. It doesn't matter how many times you fall over flat on your face and how many times you have a nervous breakdown. We've probably all had one from time to time. You're just not going to admit it because uh, you, you're worried about what people will think. But you've fallen apart. You've fallen on your face. You have really screwed up in your life. You've made terrible decisions. And guess what? No one has a right to judge you. Because guess what? The Lord is able to make you stand. I always think about the boxer. I watched this boxer once. He was a fat guy. Fat boxer from Eastern Europe. And he was being pummeled by a very in shape man who was looked a bit younger, but at least was an extreme 
extremely good shape. Now that's not to say that the fat man wasn't strong. Underneath that fat, there was great power. But he didn't fight much at all. He just stood there and took the punches, one after another. I was waiting for him to fall over. Didn't happen. He would every now and then, he almost seemed lazy, but he would every now and then just throw up his arm and boop. Didn't seem to have any effect on the other guy. Well, he lost the fight, but when he was knocked down, he got right back up. When he was punched, he took the punch. And in my view, he wasn't a loser at all. And there are many believers who have to understand, yes, we're going to mess up. We're going to be punched. We're going to be knocked out. We're going to knock ourselves out. We're going to make decisions that could even nearly destroy ourselves, but the Lord intervenes. Why? Because of Romans 14.4 where it says, And stand he will, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Now you might be gossiping about one of those people who the Lord is making stand or he's making him to stand. Now me, being in a position of pastor teacher to not a huge congregation, but people listen to me, and I receive gossip, obviously, all pastors do. I mean, that's something that, 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 that comes with the territory. But guess what? I'm standing here. And I'm not standing here on my own volition. It's the Lord who is able to make me stand. Am I perfect? No. Do I irritate people sometimes? Yes. Do people get angry with me? Yes. Oftentimes, simply because the two-edged sword of the Word of God cuts both ways and it slices you in some area of arrogance and you react terribly. That's your choice. I'm immune to that stuff. It used to get to me, but you grow out of it. The more you grow spiritually, the more you grow out of it. I will admit it used to get to me that I, because I couldn't understand. Because I would teach day by day by day and I just couldn't understand some of the things that I was hearing that were totally contradictory to the things that I had been teaching. And it would blow my mind. And I wouldn't say much, but I would come under attack. Well, if you, if you have the gift of pastor teacher and you are going to teach the Word of God as it is, of course you're going to be attacked. People attack grace. And the reason why they attack grace is because grace attacks their arrogance. And they think they are more important than what the Word of God has to say. And every time they hear a verse that contradicts what they believe about themselves, they blow up in anger. Well, all of us are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, all of us who have believed. We are all members of the body of Christ. We are all royal family of God. And the evaluation of our lives is our responsibility. It's not the responsibility of someone else. That's why Romans 14.10 states, But you, why do you judge your fellow believer? Or you again, why do you regard your fellow believer with contempt? For we shall stand before the evaluation throne of Jesus Christ. Now, regarding another believer with contempt indicates a tremendous function of arrogance in your life. And why? It's because you don't, you don't know that person. You don't know the exact stage of that believer's spiritual growth. They could be a baby believer. They could be a mature believer. And in that case, you're in trouble. If you exercise contempt for another believer, it's inevitable that you're going to try to find some way to malign them. What's malign? Maligning is a lust to hurt. It is a 
use of the tongue that tries to hurt. It goes along with malice and maliciousness. And there are people who are malicious. They want to hurt someone else and they think they can build their happiness upon someone else's happiness and they do so with the tongue. With a public lie. Has anyone ever made a public lie about you? Has anyone ever made a public truth about you? It doesn't matter. What you do is between you and the Lord. You have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And all the other relationships that you have, it's normal to have them, friendships. It's normal to be married. It's normal to have uh, social outings, etc. But do you know, a lot of that becomes a great distraction, especially for those who are not mature. Because you're going to be gossiped about and you may not be able to handle it. You might fall all apart. But this really isn't about you, the one being gossiped about. It's about the one who gossips. The one who holds another in contempt. The one who condemns the wrong things that you've done, whether they are real or imagined. It could be real. You see, gossip is truth, actually. When you gossip about someone, you're not lying. For example, you could say, I was walking, you could say this, I was walking down High Street in Columbus, Ohio, and I saw one of the believers in our church walk into one of those pothead shops. What do they call them? Head shops. And he came out with a pipe. And I saw him do it. Well, there you go. There's gossip. Now, it's true. He saw it all. It's still gossip. And it's still none of his business. Besides... What's he going to do with the pipe? Who knows? Or you may say, then I went over to his house, I went inside, and I had a terrible smell of marijuana all throughout the house. So there he is, sinning, it's true, becoming intoxicated, and any time you're intoxicated with anything, and I mean intoxication, uh, then you're out of fellowship, and marijuana will intoxicate you in, within five minutes. And that's it. You're intoxicated and you're out of fellowship. You can't think straight and you are trying to sublimate and cover the problems of life by feeling good. And it is a sin. And then this person runs to church and tells everyone about it. Who's the worst in this case? I'll tell you who's the worst. The one who runs off and gossips. The man who sat down and smoked a joint and sinned, that's between him and the Lord. I use that as a shocking type illustration because drugs are terrible. And there is no, for me, I will never be an advocate of illicit drug use. Never. It's terrible. It's destructive to a country. But still, if I see a believer doing that, I have no right to talk about them. That's between them and the Lord. And yet these believers run off to their church and say they were in there smoking the marijuana, which is a sin. And in this case, we'll just say it's the truth. So that's gossip. Or you could take something like a taboo. You walk into somebody's house and they're smoking a cigar, which has nicotine. And they're not even inhaling the cigar. They're just holding the smoke in their mouth and puffing it out. If you inhale a cigar, you get a huge uh, influx of nicotine. Not very healthy at all, but hey, whatever. But uh, usually a, someone who smokes a, a uh, cigar who knows how to smoke one will puff it into their mouth and let the nicotine go go in through the mouth and not through the lungs, which makes it less potent. And that's not sin. 
tobacco. It's nicotine. And uh, nicotine has about as much effect on someone as coffee. You say, I don't believe that. Let me tell you something. If you've been a heavy coffee drinker for most of your life and you suddenly quit, you will get the worst headache you've ever had and you'll be drinking coffee in a second. You're addicted to coffee. And you can actually feel worse than the person who quit smoking the cigar. I know. I've seen it. I used to drink a lot of uh, Coca-Cola that has caffeine, and it's addictive, but it's not sin. If you're a Mormon, you think so. Anyway, this is all about judging and gossiping. And this is what our study will be about in snippets here and there. And if you want to learn more, you can go to www.aelewisministries.org. If you've been listening to this and you're here listening without Christ, without hope, and without eternal life, I'm here to tell you that there is hope. That you can believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and that will be the moment of your salvation. For it says in John 3.15 that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. John 3.16, God loved the world so much that he gave his uniquely born son so that whosoever believes in him shall never perish but have eternal life. And you can't work for it. For Romans 3.28 says, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And then in Romans 4, 4 through 5, it even makes it clearer. Now to the one who works for salvation, his wages are calculated not on the basis of grace, but on the basis of debt. In other words, you're digging yourself a deeper and deeper hole the more you work for salvation. You're going into debt. But he who believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith receives credit for righteousness.